Greetings, Cursed! It's Tuesday, and that means it's time for your dose of Curse of Politics. Like a spoonful of cough medicine, Curse of Politics <laughs> is a remedy. Some of it's going to make you gag, but God damn it, you know it's good for you. Jenny from the Lock. Jenny Byrne, the fennel and foil, is here to give us what she always gives us, the no-bullshit truth. Scott Reed is here with his wit, strategic insight, and arcane comic book references. Today we're going to talk about the reflective processes, or lack of reflective processes, we're seeing from all parties. Trudeau can't win his majority. Jagmeet Singh picks up one. Count him one seat. Darling, you got to let me know. Should O'Toole stay or should he go? <laughs> Bernier is calling for his own leadership review. And Annamie Paul is likely, well, Annamie Paul did it yesterday. She resigned. So let's get to it. Jenny, Scott, we have a lot on our plate today. But first of all, <laughs> how are you? How are you? It's 49 years since Paul Henderson scored his goal today. I know. Happy Canada I Day. I know. He should be in the Hall of Fame. No, he shouldn't. But I'm not well. I'm not well. Can I tell you guys something? I got a. Do you remember a couple of weeks ago I told you guys that my car was stolen? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So yesterday I got an even worse call. My car has been recovered. <laughs> oh, that's bad, isn't it? My car has been recovered, and I'm obligated to to take it back. I had all sorts of plans and designs on fancy new car. All that's gone now. My SUV uh, was discovered in Weston Road. <laughs> Where it's been living, I presume, for three weeks. I don't know what it's been I hope it has that to. Seinfeld smell. I hope it well, has this that is Seinfeld the thing, smell right? to it. Yeah, no, it's going in for a little detailing, but I must receive it. And <laughs> and so this is this is actually the second time this has happened to you. Have you ever heard of this? Have you ever known anyone who's encountered this in your entire life? So two years ago, my car was stolen and recovered a couple of weeks later in a parking lot. Now it was recovered. Three weeks later, it's discovered in a parking lot, recovered in a parking lot. Like... Like this never happens. Doesn't like this I, happen more commonly? Doesn't this happen more commonly to people with teenage sons? <laughs> you would think, except they're all out of the house. The coppers tell me that it's because <laughs> it's because of it's because of COVID and supply chain issues that they can't get the stolen that the demand for the stolen vehicles is as high as ever. But the supply of container shipments getting it out of the ports is 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 restricted. And so they're they're leaving it. Uh, in parking lots and they're discovering more and more stolen vehicles as they wait around uh, to get uh, shipped to Asia or wherever. And so there you have it. So now, now I've got to, I got to take so my slightly used. car. Yeah. And do you get any uh, compensation for that? No, I have to pay all kinds of shit. I had to go to the, t I, I could spend the whole podcast talking about what happened to me at the tow Don't. truck yard yesterday. It was, it was a, fucking ordeal and i think the car's just i don't even think the car's getting stolen like i think it's just running away it obviously just doesn't want to be here don't you think i mean it's happened twice in two years i think it's like fuck when can i get out of the lease with this guy i hate fucking reed he's a cock i want out it just drives away after every six months to a year it just pulls itself out of the driveway and boots it anyway there you have it so that's my day all right back to politics it's kind of like now i don't know if i want the car i want to get rid of the car but i'm not sure it's worth it which is a little bit like Aaron O'Toole and the Conservatives. Oh. Segway, Jenny. Jenny, are Boom, you uh, what a pro? Jenny, are you interested in yourself enough to tell a story like that, or can we move on? Uh, listen, I, I I like to keep the tradition of the first three or four minutes of the podcast being something I rare, I, I only listen to with a, a quarter percent. So, so that was, <laughs> so I, I really enjoyed that story, Scott. What a just, shout! What a shout out to Nick Taylor Vasey that one. <laughs> um, right. I feel well, it's nice to be back together. I see you guys agree with my car. You are out of this lease. So listen, we, we, going on this week, we got Anime Paul goes out all guns blazing. We've got tepid public endorsements of Aaron O'Toole, but a lot going on that is not public. We've got some liberals forming a government <laughs> while other liberals contemplate what it means to be a 30 to 35% party as opposed to a 35 the 40% party, and all new Democrats seem to be happy. They must be drinking the smoothies that Nicole Kidman is handing out on nine perfect strangers. <laughs> the TV show. Let's start, Jenny. Let's start, Jenny, with the conservatives. But can you... Wow, can, sh unless shocking that to, you guys want to... Uh, shocking you guys want to start there. Exactly. No, we're going to put you right on the hot seat. But before we get right there, 
Can you give us a little primer on how the Conservative Party works? They're all different. So in this discussion about leadership and direction of the party that's going on, what's the role of caucus? What's the role of the national executive? What's the role of riding associations, et cetera? How does this all happen? Well, they can all, listen, not in like our life, not in my lifetime that I can remember a conservative party, uh, a leader has been, uh, has decided to, uh, to leave, to resign based on an official vote. This is something that happens. If you lose support of your party, um, you you're not going to stay on as leader. It doesn't matter whether there's an official vote or not. Uh, if you lose riding presidents, if you lose caucus, you guys know this, uh, know this better than me in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of Jean Chrétien losing support, uh, within the liberal party, uh, before you guys took over. If, if once you lose support, you lose support. And so um, I think the roles that any of those, uh, any anyone that falls into that category um, uh, has is, is what, how willing they are to speak out in terms of, uh, of whether Aaron or any leader should stay on, um, should stay on. The, the endorsements have been very tepid. Um, uh, and I've laughed at obviously not coordinated because Brad Wall um, came out. And by the way, anyone that hasn't listened to David's interview with Brad Wall, they should go. Awesome. They should go back and listen to it. It was a fantastic, um, a fantastic uh, interview, David. I, th I thought it was great. Um, but he came out with like a tepid endorsement of of Aaron, like. The, 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 the easiest thing you could say, but then as soon as he did it, you had members of Aaron's team uh, from the Quebec side uh, re refer to him actually as trash. Like they actually used the emoji can of a garbage can, which I didn't actually even know it existed until someone had uh, um, someone had sent it to me. And so it's going to be interesting to see at the end of the day, the the the. The argument to keep Aaron on is 100% uh, emotional because there is no empirical data uh, to keep him on. It's, and they, the only argument would be it's, we don't want to have a leadership race or, or leaders are kept on for two, for, for two kicks at the can, which isn't true. Leaders that are kept on for two kicks at the can um, uh, are ones that the party sees a, a, as able to win. And I think as the election results, we saw it last week when we talked, but as more and more of the election results become um, uh, kind of become apparent as people see more and more uh, what, you know, what the, the, uh, how people voted on uh, on election day, it's becoming harder and harder for people within uh, within Aaron's uh, circle to be able to make a coherent argument as to how, why they think he should stay on and get another chance. Haven't they? Well, done... you know, in the major parties, in the major parties, you don't get to lose an election really anymore. You did, I guess, back in the fifties and sixties, but you don't really get to lose an election anymore. Clark was destroyed by losing 1980. The only thing that we were able to argue in 84 for Turner was that, uh, in 86 for Turner in the review, was that Turner hadn't had a real chance in 84, that 84 wasn't his election. But when he lost in 88, there was no question that he had to step down. Paul lost, he had to, Paul lost, he stepped down. Uh, Pierre Trudeau stepped down after 79. So, I mean, Harper that's... hung on in 04. It, it, that's an obvious... Yeah, but, 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 but there was, but there was a path to victory. There was, it was, there was a, you guys were going to win the biggest majority in Canadian history. And, uh, uh, he merged the parties and, uh, became leader of the opposition in, uh, uh, in less than six months. We picked up, we picked up, uh, uh, 20, 22 seats in Ontario. Like there was, there was a trajectory. There was a reason this is, would be akin to you guys keeping Stephen Dion on, um, uh, for the sake of Thank saying, God you're still around to remind people of what the expectations were of us in 2000. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah. I took, <laughs> I took all the bunting down just yesterday. <laughs> Mission accomplished. <laughs> no, you guys had those balloons and fucking thunderstuck sticks with Bono. Uh, I, I remember it. Yeah, uh, yeah. I remember it. Uh, it, was so, I it was so triumphal. My God, yes. Hey, listen, you guys wanted to start with me, so this is what you get. So um, early victory lap. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyways, it's just, it's a very emotional argument. Co conservative MPs, uh, who I think have a lot more power than they think that they do have to decide whether, uh, one of two things has to happen. Either Aaron decides to, to, uh, morph himself into another version of himself and realize that he made mistakes this campaign in terms of, uh, in terms of the policy direction, which seems to be no indication based on, uh, any of his communications or the communications of his team over the last, um, week or they we can we continue a status quo to run 
essentially as liberals and I uh, we go into the next election like, like that. But uh, I'll be honest, if if I was sitting in caucus, it's it obviously didn't work there. Carrie K- Diot, uh, who was the MP for Edmonton Griesbach, he got he got 53 percent of the vote in 2019. David, I know that if we were if you were sitting doing a target list, there wouldn't be a lot of MPs uh, on that list that you would be worried about if they had won with 53 percent of the vote. Alice Wong had lost has won by 49 percent of um, percent of the vote. And you have conservative MPs who went from 70 percent into the 50s. These are not insignificant. Uh, these are not insignificant um, um, uh, numbers. And I think that uh, the policy direction, like I, I read Brad's uh, Brad's uh, endorsement of, of air and his his flaccid type endorsement. But one of the things he talked about was his support for the West and what have you. And in that, and he 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 at least refer if he didn't refer to, he alluded to Bill C69, which is the anti-pipelines bill. And it that's that's another issue that didn't get a lot of uh play during the last election. But Aaron went from uh wanting to repeal Bill C69 in his true blue pat- platform to somehow uh vaguely talking about amending it. So these are things that the Conservative Caucus um I want to consider. So can I ask uh, let me ask you a question, Jenny. Do you think because it appears, much like the first two weeks of the election campaign, I think there's a, a cruel analogy. It appears as though there's early momentum for O'Toole. Uh, I hear all of what you're saying, and I've heard it from others. But I think they've done an effective job of pushing people out to do endorsements, of saying, listen, now it's not the right time to switch horses. Let's give the guy two kicks of the can. We don't want to constantly be, we don't want to create the precedent that you only get one shot and then it's out. Um, and we've seen um, we've seen a series of MPs. We've seen party, uh, you know, sort of party uh, highlights. You know, party uh, party powers and all those kinds of people coming forward. Um, and you you may say that it's a flaccid endorsement, but it's it's still an endorsement from Brad Wall. So had th- they appear to be doing a pretty effective job, don't they, of creating an environment that says it's 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 the wrong choice to to, to push for a change. But their only argument is so, that. So I saw. If I just want to jump in for a second, Jenny, because I. Uh, I appreciate I that. Somebody, I appreciate that, David. <laughs> somebody, somebody smart. I think it was Alex Panetta, who I think is a really smart guy on Twitter, and I have said, seen. said uh, the people that are uh, at anti O'Toole are speaking off the record, and the people that are pro O'Toole are speaking on the record. Advantage O'Toole, except I'm old enough to remember. <laughs> The Clark Review efforts of uh, 81 and 82 in the Conservative Party. And you know that everybody who served in his cabinet endorsed him publicly. Everybody who subsequently ran for the leadership endorsed him publicly. Mulroney held an event with him at the Ritz-Carlton Hotel in Montreal where he endorsed him, right? Sitting side by side. The whole time (laughs) all those endorsements were happening... (laughs) <laughs> no, but David, the you're... whole time all those endorsements were happening Clark was bleeding out bleeding out from the attacks that were actually going on it, it doesn't him. feel like that so though, does I it? don't take anything from what I'm seeing publicly. Yeah, but, da- but, but Scott have you actually read the endorsements like take a look at, at Leslyn Lewis's her endorsement was basically like terrible election uh, very disappointed um, and uh, anyway aside uh, Aaron is our leader. Like it's 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 to your point, David. Like I like the I like. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of people that are out uh, talking about uh, 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 the, you know people speaking publicly. I I have spoke publicly and and always have. So I assume that co- comments comments about people talking off the record can't be directed at me because I've been as public as as one could be. But if you look at the analysis that most conservative conservatives are putting up it's you know it's very brave it's very brave to come out after an election loss and say i'm very disappointed i think we would we should we would we could have done better and i'm going to see what the leader has to say well fuck wow it's that is that is a stunning that is a stunning bit of analysis that no one would have fucking thought of uh thought of themselves that is not that is that is not actually offering anything uh, to the debate Stunning bit of fucking analysis so Scott, is uh, so Scott, you, so Scott, on my you and I day. have some. <laughs> Use it or lose it. 
It's a principle I generally agree with. Because, hurly-burlyites, I've seen what can go wrong when important things in life fall into disuse. My abs, for instance. Right now, I can execute one sit-up, but I'm working my way up to two. So let's talk about Spectrum and how important it is to use it to connect rural Canadians. Our presenting sponsor, TELUS, knows this, and more importantly, they do it. Spectrum is the radio waves that make your cell phone work in areas of the country where a wired connection isn't an option because of rough terrain or lack of infrastructure. Essentially, rural Canada. It's a public resource. You need a license from the government to provide service. But here's what's happening right now. Too many rural communities have their spectrum controlled by regional companies who would rather sit on it and eventually resell it for millions in profit than actually use it to improve connectivity. And don't be confused by the label regional. These are multi-billion dollar companies who've received billions in government spectrum subsidies. Here's the number, and I warn you, it's kind of shocking. These regional carriers deploy less than 20% of the rural spectrum they hold. TELUS, on the other hand, has the strongest track record of deploying its rural spectrum. Almost two-thirds of it is put to use. Over 95% of rural Canadians can work, learn, and thrive online in areas where TELUS has the licenses. But beyond this, TELUS could boost service to 150,000 households in Alberta and 120,000 households in BC if underutilized spectrum was simply unlocked. As a technology leader with a social purpose, TELUS believes you either use the un unused spectrum and put it to work to benefit all Canadians, or you should lose it. We'll talk more about this in the coming weeks, but for now, you can go to telus.com slash connecting Canada. You and I have some experience in leadership challenges uh, on both sides of them, and yeah. we know that, at least in the Liberal Party, there are two essential issues that will be going on. One of which is, can the guy win or can the guy not win? And that is, in the Liberal Party, question number 1A with a bullet. Right. Yeah. It may be it may be it less may be one, two, and three. In yeah. In the Conservative Party it may be less determinative. The other one is do you represent us? Do we feel comfortable with you? Are you the person that uh I that I believe in? Um and that's obviously the problem Mulcair had in addition to winning with the NDP. So well, and there's a third. There's an I, I know that Brad I know that Brad Wall endorsed I know that Brad Wall endorsed uh, O'Toole in the National Post today, but on my show, he said, I couldn't find a difference between the O'Toole campaign platform and the Liberal platform. He, he definitely, and he talked about the Liberal light thing a bit. Um, I would say there's a third element, though, David, and that is an alternative around which uh, disaffection can coalesce. Um, and sometimes that will be a Michael oh, Heseltine yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, rabbit that just leads the race and is uh, and, and and opens a way for someone else. Sometimes it's a power. Sometimes it's Chrétien to Turner. Sometimes it's Martin to uh, Chrétien. Sometimes it's Turner to Trudeau. Whatever, right? But around so so we'll see if that emerges um, as well. But um, I, I'm not trying to be you know difficult with you two. I'm just saying that so far it seems to me that the O'Toole guys have been more effective in the first two weeks of defending his leadership than they were in the final two weeks of the campaign in trying to win votes. And I, I just wonder what that means. So, so David, to your, to your, to your point, um, winning is a big, winning is a big deal to uh, conservative members. Uh, we are also a party of coalitions, fiscal conservatives, social conservatives, Western reformers, uh, libertarians, uh, Democratic reformers. There is a whole host of the coalition. Stephen Harper brought those people together, and that we have had a uh, a party for uh, seventeen years and governed for uh, for ten of that. Aaron O'Toole uh, ran on a leadership where he said, "Sure, the other guy might be able to to win. The other guy might be able to win, but I am the only guy that can hold this coalition together because because this guy is what." you might want to call a so-called red Tory and he's going to blow it up. He hates the West. He hates reformers, all of this kind of stuff. It was, it was nasty. And there was actually no evidence to that. Peter McKay sat for 10 years in, in government. He, he, one could argue if Peter McKay 
uh, uh, Peter McKay could have could have spent 20 years as the leader of the PC party, even if they sat it in third party status and and he would have stayed as leader of the PC party. So so at the end of the day, Aaron, this is part of the reckoning that Aaron has to have. He ran by saying that he was the only guy that could win, not only win, but keep the coalition together. And what he has done is not win and actually stay hurt the coalition because for the first time since our party's inception, people are people are feeling alienated because not only were were big segments of that base uh, pushed out, they were they were neg not neglected. Uh, they were asked to to step aside that we did. We didn't need it. He campaigned as and he didn't need that. Uh, he didn't need that help. So let me throw a thought in the table. If I was O'Toole's team. I'd be saying we're doing okay. We're getting endorsements out there. We're trying to create an environment where the onus is on others to prove that the leader should be dislodged as opposed to um, that being the working assumption. But everything that you say, Jenny, seems to me to be sensible. And you got to know uh, that another wave is coming. And I wonder if he needs to put something in the window to um fortify his position and block opposition and i wonder would it be a damning reversal and prove that he is the weather vane candidate a la the peter mckay true blue and all that kind of stuff or would it be a wise tactical decision to forestall pushback particularly from western caucus members in the western base of the party by coming forward and saying look you know we're going to have this discussion about what we did right what we did wrong we're going to do a post-mortem one thing i've concluded as leader is I surrendered my ability to make the argument around affordability and those issues by doing this savings allowance fucking Kmart account thing. And from now on, we'll be running on a platform that recognizes climate change, that has an aggressive plan to deal with it, but that will not include a meaningless, silly carbon tax that just takes money out of people's pocket but doesn't actually fight climate change. If he did that, would that... How would that play? Well, would would you would you believe him? Okay, well that's 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 the answer then, right? Is that you think? Would, that you, it, would you guys would you guys believe him? I believe anything he said. He's like a fighter pilot. I think you got to take him at face value. That guy, he's uh, you know, he's a navigator. Okay, Scott. we've 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 been over this. I know, but I, I well, I believe that I believe that he has demonstrated that he'll say what it takes to get through the day. And I guess I'm asking, would that help him get through days? Yeah, but that's getting through the days is what getting getting through the days is is getting through f fine. It could maybe it could get him through a day. I'm just not sure are people going to believe it. I that's the question I would ask to people. I know it doesn't matter what my think my feeling is. If if Aaron O'Toole came out and and said I'm I'm a little bit I'm I'm still more true blue. I made a mistake. Are people going to believe him? And because the yeah. one the most effective ad the most effective line of attack that Trudeau had was when he pivoted in week three or whenever it was to that this guy will say anything yeah. to get elected because that's him. ultimately that's it's the gun the gun stuff actually was was a was a child of that it was that is part of the the, the problem yeah. that he that he had so the most effective attack ad is always the the one that has the most truth and so so if people believe that then it's it sure but um i'm just not sure people will i i'm not sure people people will okay you know, Wall was super interesting on climate change, Abe, yeah. because he his political strategy was – he. I don't think he would have recommended doing what you're doing because I don't think he would have liked taking carbon tax off the table as an isolated initiative. His idea was to play offense on this and basically say to the liberals, Canada's emissions are minuscule part of the problem. Your objective is only to somewhat reduce Canada's emissions. What kind of fucking weak contribution to this crisis is that? Um we should be mounting a major offensive on nuclear and on all kinds of other technologies to fight this and, and actually play offense on climate change rather than defense and do it without a carbon tax. So it was kind of interesting. Well, didn't he say he'd maintain a modest That's carbon tax possibly just to like have stakes in it? And I, so I, I thought his was a really interesting uh, political analysis and suggestion. I'm not certain that it, I, I don't know. I still not sure I'd want to, if I was a conservative, Right. And I'm not. But if I was a conservative, I might want I'm not sure I'd want to surrender the carbon tax. I think I'd want to have that so I could do a full fledged assault on affordability and picking people's pockets. I think that argument might be even more powerful a year and a half, two years from now. Well, it can't be 
It can't be that you need a carbon tax to have a good climate change policy because nobody's going to say Biden has a shitty climate change policy and Biden's not going to have a carbon tax. Yeah. 100%. Right? You, are, you are right, Dave. Okay. All right. Time to put <laughs> time to put us on the couch, right, Dave? <laughs> time to put the liberals. Time to yes, time to finally. Yeah. Conservatives leave the room, liberals enter the room, lie down on the couch. So I've talked a lot on this pod about the duties companies like our sponsor CN have to the public. The duty of safety, the duty of providing unfailing service to customers, the rather awesome duty of carrying a significant chunk of the Canadian economy on its shoulders. But publicly held companies, and that is what CN is, have another duty. Simply put, they must keep up in a ferociously competitive business environment. They must turn a reasonable profit and provide value to their shareholders. Fail in that duty, and it doesn't turn out well for anyone, customers and shippers and grain farmers and manufacturers included. So CN is launching an ambitious value creation plan. It will push out the boundaries of efficiency, using its vast store of railroading expertise and the bleeding edge technology it's acquired in recent years. It intends to provide an even better return. I'm not going to get into details like operating ratios and share repurchases and capital expenditures as a percentage of revenue, but they are essential parts of CN's plan, and it wants its investors to understand that. CN's massive advantage is its 19,000 miles of track spanning Canada and the United States. One of the company's biggest investors recently called it the finest railway network in North America, and he was right. CN's new strategic plan is meant to keep it that way. Um, so uh, we won. We won the election. We won it fairly decisively, closer to a majority than to losing in seats. Um, and yet 32% of the vote, 32% of the vote in an election in which there is no Green Party, uh, and in which the NDP are doing a little bit better than normal, but not hugely better than normal. So that's that's what we got in that's what we got in uh, twenty uh, nineteen, and sort of only in only in twenty fifteen have we soared above that number and still didn't hit forty. I think it was thirty nine something. Only in twenty fifteen. Have we been above that number since 2000? Uh, to, since 2004, sorry, 2004, we got 38. So uh, what is going on with the liberal vote? And is it something we need to, something we need to worry about? I mean, I look at, we're still winning the seats we need to win in Ontario. We're winning the seats we need to win in Atlanta, Canada. We're winning more seats than we used to win in Vancouver. But you know, by gosh, by golly, when I look at Saskatchewan, in 1980, after Pierre Trudeau had been in office for 16 years and was legendarily hated in Western Canada and was running a campaign against a Westerner and running effectively against Western Canada in the campaign, Liberal Party got 24% of the vote in Saskatchewan. We considered that marginal. We knew we weren't players, but we got 24% of the vote. This election, less than 10. Scott, are you worried? Yeah, I, I, I bet. Do you think about these things? I do think about these things. I do think about these things. And there's, a lots, there's lots of different ways to slice up um, the voting pie, right? Like, how do you want to define it? You want to define it by region? You want to find it by gender, demos, all that sort of stuff? And which of those analysis is likely to provide you with some insight that creates a better path forward? I think if we look at it, the good news is, as you mentioned, urban and suburban, we're in strong position. Like, the fact that we could run a campaign the way we did, uh, which, let's face it, for two weeks basically was gone fishing, um, and still hold 905 seats and lower mainland uh, seats, um, that's a real, like, that to me is a real 
damning statement on on the conservatives and Aaron O'Toole, right? The fact you got to be able to you, your forward claim to your leadership, I think, has to be based around your capacity to win those suburban seats. No one's going to apply that test to you in, in urban, and and they, he he didn't do it. Uh, you, and I think that's you a, guys, it's, yeah. You guys picked up you guys picked up six uh, suburban seats and two uh, urban ones. Yeah, from us. And so I think. I think all that's strong. I think if you look at what's what's concerning, um, I'm mixing and matching my my points of analysis. I think Quebec continues to be a concern. You got to figure out how to solve Quebec. That would have given you a majority. Second, you gotta you gotta melt. I think it isn't enough to just live off the gender gap. I think you've got to melt some of that um, some of that male vote. Um, if men in basically every demographic don't want to vote for you for one reason or another. Um, maybe that tells us a lot about men. I'm sure it does, uh, which, you know, dispiriting maybe or thrilling, depending on your perspective. But I think you got to I think you got to find um, it, it's a, it, like you got to melt that a little bit. You, you don't need you don't need to conquer, but you need you need to you need to improve your margins there, I think. And so I think that's an economic argument, as I've said in the past. I think that there needs to be a stronger uh, I think if it, it, I, I think we are we have learned from the trajectory of the last couple of elections under Trudeau, that the Trudeau brand is not enough to sustain you at 38%. It looks like it's enough to sustain you at 31%, even with blackface in 2019 and a tepid effort in uh, in 2021. But it's not, it's, it is a law of diminishing returns as an asset. It just stands to reason. That's not even a condemnation of the prime minister. That's just the facts of life of being an incumbent. And so you've got to find something that rises above and apart. He needs a sword, an issue that he can use as a sword to win votes and carve votes, not just his smile. And so I look at those two places. What do you need to do in Quebec? What do you need to do to melt votes with men? I think if you put that together, I think one of the answers is probably some uh, a more pronounced economic growth strategy that sounds sensible and operates in companionship, um, in, in compatibility with your climate play. Um, and I think you got to figure out how do you win on the edges in Quebec and make the block less relevant and allow you to be competitive off the island in, in, in Quebec. I think you solve those two things, uh, you get back to majority. So could Tr Trudeau, though, suffers a little bit, not to the same extent of uh, that that we've talked about with Aaron is he's he he is he is seen as inauthentic. Among his critics and among those that are and and and, yeah. and maybe that's that's growing. I, I think if you surveyed all those men that don't want to vote for him, they'd all say performative. You know, they'd say all the pejorative shit, right? He's performative, uh, drama teacher, all that kind of shit. Some of that's been lingering around him since the day. He no, came but look into at politics. women. But, but look at women. We yeah. sat on a panel. We sat on a panel with uh, Jody Wilson Raybould, and she recoiled every single time he came onto screen. So it's not just right. men. And that she's are completely doing representative, it. as we know, of all I don't, of, of, I don't of all think Canadians. <laughs> I don't um, think she is. I don't think she is at all. And you, you, you like you I know, know you that. Know, but I'm saying know, there, there is, it, there isn't. He is not authentic. The, the shininess has worn off. We, yeah. it wore off with it. It is. It has. It has worn off. Um, and that is a problem that him, and that's the problem the Liberal Party is going to have to, uh, um, is going to have to deal with. But to your point, Scott, I agree. I still think he he brings more to the table than another leader. I still think he is probably still there. Um, uh, their number one um, asset, at least among your base. So at least among people that your core 30 to 32 percent of people that are going to vote for you, um, he he stays uh, he stays there. He also seemingly needs to pick a fight with the block if he wants to uh, win uh, win Quebec, because if you look at the numbers, I think there were only three or four seats that we finished second in that we didn't win. So we kept our we kept our 10 seats. We 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 won them uh, with a with a good uh, a good number of uh, uh, with 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 increases in Quebec. Uh, but I think, as I said, I think there was three or four. I could be wrong. So please don't. But it wasn't a lot. We finished third or fourth in a lot of the riding. So this is Justin Trudeau and the Liberals. You guys have to figure out what fight you are going to pick with the Bloc Québécois, in my opinion, if 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 you want to uh, increase your stakes in Quebec, so David, I'm the snappy comeback. I'm the snappy comebacks, the stupid yeah. questions guy. You're the actual numbers and strategist guy. So <laughs> take apart what I said and give us the actual strategy to sustain and, and improve the Liberal Party. No, I don't know. I don't know. I don't. I don't know what it is. But I, I first of all, I want to agree with you too on terms of leadership. Like the guy is such a good campaigner. Like we are going to miss when, when we have another leader and we're watching that person out on the hustings day after day, 
we're going to miss Trudeau. He's fucking good. He's articulate. He's compelling. He looks fantastic. Uh, he's great with people. Um, he's a tremendous, tremendous campaigner. Um, uh, but, and this is to both of you, everybody who got elected as a liberal in 2015 knew that they got there completely on Trudeau's coattails, that they had no business being in Parliament other than that he'd come along and they got to ride that wave yeah. with him. Yep. Everybody who got elected to Parliament as a Liberal this time spent at least the first two weeks taking shit about Trudeau at the door. Yep, that's fair. Does that change, does that change the dynamic between caucus and the centre? Mm. Well, he's always seemingly had a problem with caucus, and we, that's why we've seen the difference between kind of um, Trudeau 2019 onwards, and I say even before the election. Like, I I, I know, like, like uh, Scott, I agree with you on Jody Wilson-Raybould. I'm just talking about the feminist bullshit um, arguments that that Trudeau makes. I think that shine has worn off. I think people sure. have seen it, seen it for, um, I've uh, seen it for, for, for what it is. Um, but I think David, that's the issue. They, as, as you know, caucus, you've got people that run for the most part. Most people I think are good, decent people that have different issues that they, um, they care about. And of course they want to keep their seat. So the problem Trudeau has is he's now in a position where most leaders actually always are in. He's just never, he's just never had to, to do it before that you have to actually keep your caucus happy. They have to believe in you. You have to take accountability for the decisions you make that make them eat shit in their riding and lose votes. He never had to worry about that nor cared. Like it was the stories that we all heard that that Trudeau had had one or two conversations or some some MPs off the record would say, I've never had a conversation with him since I being elected since being elected. And I can't just even imagine how the fuck that happens. Just like it like it shows you how regardless of how you want to talk about past administrations being uh, controlling that nothing like that would have happened. Like caucus was was paramount for Stephen Harper. Like it was that was a priority. Like it was it was an extreme priority to him and what their interests were. He didn't always agree with them and they all, they weren't always happy with him, but he always listened to them. And I think that Trudeau is just, his people have to pivot. And I think we saw this at the start of this election that they, they haven't realized that they're not the, the celebrities that, that, that could get away with shit before. They're actually, sorry guys, welcome to the fucking bigs. You guys are now have to do what we all three have done, which is which which is managing a political party is a big fucking deal. And you don't have just the celebrity that you have to, that to deal with. So you're actually going to have to deal with issues. You're going to have to deal with people. OK, but let me just give you guys a little truth track here. Little dose, little <laughs> dose of street smarts <laughs> and reality. OK, that's all true. And God knows Paul was the same way. Like caucus, he would, our noses were covered in shit from being dragged around saying, call this caucus member, do what this caucus member says. I don't care if the Eiffel Tower is supposed to stay in Paris. He wants it in Paris, Ontario. You get it to fucking Paris, Ontario. That all for sure would always happen. But you are going to take a call. You are going to take a call on Sunday afternoon <laughs> from... Uh, <laughs> you're going to take a call from John McKay on Sunday afternoon, and you're going to explain to him why you're asking people what they think about evangelical Christians in politics on your survey. Yes, you are, David Hurley. And I thought you were going to have you're another You're going to fucking Maurizio. make John McKay happy about that, and you're going to reassure him <laughs> that we're not going to use evangelical Christians as a wedge politically, That's aren't you? Just That yeah. is just a top of your head, made up kind of like, you know, could be sort of example. <laughs> I was expecting a Maurizio Bellavacqua story. Oh, no, that, 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 oh, that, yeah, that's yeah, no. more complicated. There was, a, there was a big turn in that highway. Um, uh, Did you say Bellaclava? No, Bellavacqua. Bellavacqua. Okay. Um, but where I was going was this. I hear what you guys are saying, but um, the, the same caucus members that you would hear occasionally chirp about the fact that they'd never had a conversation with the prime minister did not know in that class of 2015 that there had been caucuses that had existed since confederation that had the right to expect or demand or receive that attention. And I, I maybe that's chipped away slightly, but I, I, I don't think that the fundamental caucus dynamic in this government is going to, is going to alter. I don't think, uh, yes, they took shit from the guy, uh, took shit at the doorways about Trudeau calling the election in the first two weeks, but they 
they also watch the guy put the campaign on his back in the final 10 days. And they know that there is no alternative out there, imagined or real, that would necessarily hold those suburban seats for them or campaign as well. I just don't think you're going to see an uprising in a rule. This is not, you're not going to get an Attica out of this uh, Liberal caucus. It just ain't going to happen. And I'm not even sure it should happen. But um, so I don't, I don't look for big fundamental change there. I really, I just, I, I think we're applying our experience to a contemporary uh, reality that we're not part of and we don't understand completely. And I just, I, I wouldn't expect it to change. Well, you know, one of the biggest changes that could happen in the government, um, and it would be probably the most fundamental change that could happen to the government short of the prime minister leaving, and that is Katie Telford is on the verge of being the longest serving chief of staff in my memory. Who, yeah. Who would be the I, longest serving chief? She's been there. She have been there for six years. So who would? Yeah. So, I mean, maybe Coots was around that with Trudeau. Right. Um, no one in our, no one in the, my, no. my, uh, in the era I was involved in. No. It's a long time to be in that job. I mean, that job, we all have seen people do it. It's fucking incredibly draining. Unbelievably taxing. Job. It is a long time to be in that job. Right. Um, and look, if she ever left, it would alter. Uh, it, it, it would alter not just the center, the center of gravity for this, uh, because it would it would alter the way in which Trudeau operates. I think so fundamentally, like you'd have to imagine a new model, um, and and we we're full of shit to even talk about it because we don't we don't that. We we know enough from the relationships that we've had like that to know that people's perceptions of them externally are almost always flawed and fucked up and you know uh, mythologized and all that kind of stuff. So how he how he would go about replacing uh, Katie would be uh, I, I would almost hesitate to speculate like what that would look like and what that would mean. Uh, um, but you're right. It would be an earthquake of an event and it would be foolish to assume, I'm not speculating that she's leaving, but it would be foolish to assume that she stays in the job, you know, until, until the skies fall, right? You know, so it's something yeah. they may have to My contemplate. My guess is though, my guess is though it'll be her choice. It'll oh, be her choice. Oh, a hundred percent. Oh yeah. 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 It'll be her choice one day where she wakes up oh, and yeah. says, fuck, I'm tired. And, uh, yeah. I'm not like, I've got to get to know George a little bit better. And like, or, I want to, you know, I want to dig into, want to dig into Rob's, uh, fantasy baseball, uh, a little bit more thoroughly. <laughs> That's a whole aspect of my <laughs> life I've missed. Uh, it's just gotta be Jones and for it. But you hit a point, like, I love doing politics. I loved, there was never a day that I walked into uh, Party HQ or I walked into the Prime Minister's office and I didn't enjoy it. There were some days that were shitty, but I still loved it every day. But every once in a while, probably once a year, I would wake up and say, I need to not do this for three or four days. Like, I actually need to read a normal book or to not you know, check the press clippings or to not have to return these phone calls. And so I, you can only imagine doing that, like without really seemingly any breaks for, for six years. So, so um, anyways, that's just my, my two cents on that. Yeah. I don't know, man. Yeah. And it's not, yes, uh, for sure. But, but people like us, are people like us. You know what I mean? Like the worst two months of my life for sure were the two months after we got the boot. And it wasn't just because of losing and the humiliation and all that kind of stuff. It was also because I suddenly was not doing the only thing I'd ever done in my adult life and I missed it and I loved it and nothing I've done. Everything since has been gray, if I want to admit it. That was color and everything else is gray and that's the way it's going to be. Uh, unless someone makes me the you, uh, the ambassador of the United Nations and I get to like bang my foot on the table and say, don't wait for the translation, God damn it, you know what I'm saying. If I get that moment, I'll be satisfied again. But until then, it's all great, brother. No, I'm with I'm with you, Scott. I, well, but, Scott, you couldn't have a better place to audition for a spot back in the center than on this show. Well, no kidding. I mean, it's almost it's almost an application, really. It's an online application. <laughs> Since Confederation, owning a home has been part of the Canadian dream. For most people, that dream is much more than just a monthly mortgage payment. A home is where we create our fondest memories and where we can truly be ourselves. For too many, especially young adults, that reality is out of reach and it's getting worse. The good news is our original sponsor, the Ontario Real Estate Association, or RIA for short, has a plan to save the Canadian dream of home ownership. It includes lowering costs for first-time buyers, ending money laundering in the real estate market, 
in cutting years of red tape that is standing in the way of more affordable homes for families. The ARIA plan will lay the foundation for a future where all people can find a place to call home. When we support the dreams of all of us who want to own a home, we're building healthier families, stronger communities, and a safer, more secure future for all. Read their plan at aria.com backslash affordable homes. Notwithstanding everything I've said for it's two years. It's time for our hey yous. All right. It's time for our hey yous. Who's got one? Ladies and gentlemen, please return to your seats. The hey yous are about to begin. Well, I'll start, and I'm going to start uh, saying, I'm going to say this, um, uh, I'm going to start by saying that um, my, our, our friend Brooke Piggott is not going to like my hey you Ooh. because I'm falling into like your, you and you guys trap of talking about the Green Party. Um uh, but in, and so Brooke, I am, I am so sorry when you listen to this, I'm, I, I know I'm disappointing you in watching enemy Paul yesterday. Um, I've said before, I think, I think she is extremely, um, uh, naive in terms of her foray into, uh, politics, but it was obviously like, it was heartfelt. Like when she said, this was the worst time in that's my life, line, you yeah. can tell she said it. And that's, horrifying for me to think that because the best times in my life career-wise uh involve politics and so it's the green party has a lot of soul searching to look at and comments like you know comments are not comment elizabeth may stayed extremely silent i think it's evident she worked behind the scenes to if not undermine enemy paul at least at least make her life seem as um uh be as miserable as possible and she even made some form of joking comment that i saw saw in the press yesterday that was like some of my friends tell me i just got to learn how to be the um the old aunt to, the, that oversees thing or the senior queen state mother the, the den queen mother. mother is that and that's i'll queen be honest, mother queen yeah i'll be honest with you that's I'm going to be blunt. That's a pretty cunty thing to say. And so this party has to decide whether they are actually a political party or whether they are just the foil um, and hab- and um, hobby for Elizabeth May. Ah, nice job. Follow that up, Scott. Oh, thanks. Sure. <laughs> no sweat. I'm going to I was going to say ditto. Uh, but I think I'm going to pull that back now. Um, I I. I I, I, I want to say that you pulled it. Fuck, that was terrible to watch. Fuck. It was really it was terrible awful. to watch. Awful. I just want to linger on that for a second. She fucking felt. Oh. Go ahead, Dave. Sorry. No, you. Well, you're yeah, going to say the same thing I'm going to say, I think, you know, like which like that line you pulled out, Jenny, of saying this is the worst, worst time of my life. I found that crushing. I mean, that if if that's the way she feels and she clearly feels that way, it is such a damning statement about what that party did to her that, I mean, it should have been, it could be tough. It could be challenging. It could be hard and miserable at times, but it ought to be the most exhilarating and, 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 and alive time uh, of her life. And instead it was that, I just think that's, just, it really grabbed me. Sorry. Sorry, David. Well, it actually sounds like being leader of the party meant that she had uh, an ex- executive assistant and a couple of family members door knocking with her in one riding for a whole campaign. And she got to go to a debate. Yes. That that's what being the leader of the party meant. And the day of the election, they sent her a note saying, you're up for review. Um, so, you know, basically, fuck those people. Yeah. Um, and, okay, is that, you got a hey you? I do have a hey you. Um, it doesn't come embroidered with a see you next Tuesday, but uh, I've got one. Um <laughs> Uh, my hey you is a little different and it's a little weird, uh, admittedly. It's to Doug Ford. And my hey you to Doug Ford, this is kind of a preemptive strike. Go back to the beginning of this pod and what J- Jenny was talking about around, you know, the debate that's happening within the conservative movement, what's above the sheets and what's below the sheets, all that kind of stuff that's going on. And that's what's going to happen in this kind of uh, moment. I-, I hear rumblings every now and then. Doug Ford's like thinking, oh, you know, maybe I'll be a good alternative. And I think that he could actually see himself as if there's this big debate about this side versus that side, Harper versus non-Harper, uh, West versus East. Maybe I could be the guy who has the populist conservative as Ford nation. I could bring oh, Ford please. Nation to the oh, federal please. party. And so I'm just saying now, 
You've got an election to lose this summer, please, Doug Ford. Okay, you are not the remedy to the federal conservative party. I hope that conservatives make that clear. I hope that this thing never gains any traction. So it's a preemptive strike. And I'm asking my friends in, in, in at Queens Park in the press gallery, put the question to him. Put the question to him now so that he feels forced to say, no, 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 of course not. I have no interest in the federal leadership. I won't be looking at it. Put him in the corner on this thing. Make him say that he's not interested. Make it awkward for him to reverse himself on that. Because one thing the Conservative Party does not need and one thing that Canada does not need is Doug Ford as a federal party leader. Thank you, but no thank you. I don't know. Canada is a very complex and difficult country to govern. And I think that, uh, you know, a nimble mind like Doug's is ideally That's suited exactly to right. uh, yes. an agile calculator. Finding the, right, uh, finding the right balances. Yeah. My hey, you goes out to the Trudeau government as you are forming yourself. Show us the economic strategy for jobs and growth. We went through an entire election with little discussion of the economy, but the short term challenges are pretty obvious and the long term post energy challenges are daunting maybe a little frightening, put together a government, cabinet and staff designed for a focus on the economy. That's my hey you. Uh, I want to thank, obviously, our presenting sponsor, TELUS. I want to thank CN Rail. I want to thank the Ontario Real Estate Association and Gordon Pinsent and Scotty and Jenny and the whole Air Quotes media team. And thank you, all of you, cursed for listening again this week. And we'll be back, of course, at a minimum next Tuesday.